Um, I'd like to wear, welcome Eric Gelling, Executive Director of the Colorado uh, Crane Conservation Center. Um, tonight, she's going to be speaking on Sandhill Crane Conservation in Northwest Colorado. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to you, Erin. All right, thank you. <clears throat> and I'm just going to share my screen here real quick. All right, well, <clears throat> thank you everyone for um, uh, listening to me today. Um, so <clears throat> as um, Alex said, I'm with the Colorado Crane Conservation Coalition. And our mission is to conserve, conserve and protect the Rocky Mountain population of greater sandhill cranes and their habitat through science and education. So I'm gonna be talking about some of the ways that we um, conserve sandhill cranes in Northwest Colorado. So I first want to um, start out um, by talking a little bit about the cranes in Northwest Colorado. So if you don't know, the cranes that are in Northwest Colorado are part of the Rocky Mountain population of greater sandhill cranes. And there's um, a little over 20,000 cranes in this population. This is um, the subspecies Antigone canadensis tabida, so greater sandhill cranes. Um, the cranes that are all along the front range that you might see, like that travel through Denver and Boulder and that whole area, are actually part of the lesser sandhill cranes. So west of the continental divide, we have the greater sandhill cranes. Um, these sandhill cranes breed in northwest Colorado, in Utah, Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. And they winter in New Mexico, Arizona, and Northern Mexico. Now I can't get my slides to advance. Um, so a little bit about the history of, of cranes in Colorado. Um, so, you know, as I said, they breed in Northwest Colorado and North. So the Northwest Colorado is really the Southern part of the breeding range for this population. And prior to European settlement, um, they likely nested all throughout um, different areas in Colorado, in riparian corridors, and their populations really declined though in, with, with rapid expansion of the West, such that by 1975, there were only about 25 breeding pairs of sandhill cranes in Northwest Colorado. And they actually were one of the first species to get listed under the Endangered Species Act in 1975. So they, um, they, they, their population, at least in Northwest Colorado, really diminished during, you know, the, the 19th century. And, um, and, and, and in 1975, they were listed. And then there's been a lot of um, efforts to kind of increase their population within Northwest Colorado. So I just wanted to kind of show you a map of um, this population. So you can kind of see the uh, brown is where they winter in, in Arizona, New Mexico, and, and into, into Northern Mexico. Um, their migration path, which kind of goes through Southern Colorado and Colorado, and then their breeding range, which is in the green, um, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana. Um, this is a, a map from a um, uh, a recent uh, study and using GPS transmitters on sandhill cranes and and they looked at a couple of different populations. So um, I'm just going to look at the um, in terms of of the right map, um, the blue lines. That's the Rocky Mountain population. Uh, you can kind of see though that a lot of that population funnels through the southern Colorado. Um, and then kind of expands out for their breeding range. And I'm going to kind of go into that here in a little bit. Um, on the left map, you can actually see um, in Southern Colorado, this big green blob. That's the San Luis Valley of Southern Colorado, which is a major stopover site, which I'll talk about in a second. And then in Northwest Colorado, you can kind of see there's a lot of uh, red, a, kind of a big red blob, um, which is kind of their summering and uh, staging area there. 
So in terms of the cranes in Northwest Colorado, uh, they do not stay year round. They do migrate, as I said, down to New Mexico and Arizona. Um, but they do come to the, to the Northwest Colorado to nest, to raise their colts and to stage in the fall. And then they migrate south during the winter. Now, believe it or not, the cranes are actually just arriving in Northwest Colorado. Um, even though we have a lot of snow on the ground, um, they always uh, arrive typically sometime in March and there is still a lot of snow on the ground when they arrive. Um, they seek out areas with um, less snow. They seek out areas with um, where the snow is melting and, and wetlands are starting to appear. Um, so they can definitely seek out areas to find food, but um, it is a very snowy landscape when the cranes do arrive. And when the cranes arrive, um, they actually uh, still have their colts from last year. As long as they were successful in raising colts the previous year, and colts are the young birds that were um, before they're, they're um, up to breeding age. Uh, the, the families actually stay together for a full year. So the parents will come back, will travel back north with their colts, and then they'll kick, kind of kick their colts out of the area once they are getting ready to, to nest. But you can see here in this picture, there's two adults on either side, and there's a colt in the middle. And the colts look very much like the adults when they're about a year old. They have that red. Um, they have the right eye color, but they still have their juvenile or, you know, their wing feathers um, are, are still from the previous year. And that's the best way to tell which ones are the colts at this time. Now, one thing they do when they get to Northwest Colorado and, and really to their breeding areas is that they paint their feathers. So um, you guys might notice that cranes during the winter months have typically gray feathers. I mean, gray is the color of their feathers. And um, they actually paint them with iron-rich mud in preparation for breeding. Uh, most likely this is for camouflage uh, so that they blend into their nesting area and, and blend in with their colts when, they're, when their uh, chicks and colts are growing. Um, sometimes they will paint their feathers along the migration route, but typically they do it when they get to their breeding areas. So I kind of want to just um, talk a little bit about what their nesting habitat looks like in Northwest Colorado. So typically it is a um, in cranes nest in wetlands. Um, uh, in Northwest Colorado, there's a couple different types of wetlands that they'll nest in. This one is a um, filled with cattails and cattails are really common uh, nesting habitat for sandhill cranes. There actually was a nest uh, one year in the middle of this picture in this uh, wetland. Um, but they like to be surrounded uh, by water or, um, you know, very in very, very wet environments. This helps protect their nest from predators. So this is a nest that um, was seen um, north of Steamboat Springs in uh, northwest Colorado. And like I said, they like to have their nest surrounded by water. This helps protect their nest from predators. And they have, you know, long legs. They can walk through the shallow water to get to their nest. Um, the young chicks after they're born can swim, so they can swim away from their nest when they're ready. Um, but this is their preferred uh, breeding habitat. And you can see also in this photo that they uh, kind of clip the vegetation around their um, nests and that kind of helps with visibility so they can they can see who's coming. Now up at higher elevations, so um, Northwest Colorado, you know, it is kind of high elevation, right? Five, six, seven thousand uh, feet in elevation, but even at higher elevations, like eight or nine thousand feet, such as areas like uh, North Route near Steamboat Lake or California Park, um, these areas don't really have cattails, but they do have a lot of willows, and they actually have really great sandhill crane breeding excuse me, breeding habitat. Um, they have willow dominated streams and oftentimes beavers actually create dams and create perfect sandhill crane nesting habitat. Um, and, and at these higher elevations, there was a study done in the, back in the 1990s, I believe, that about 50% 
of sandhill crane nests at higher elevation were actually associated with beaver ponds. So there's a really great relationship between cranes and beavers at higher elevations. And this is actually a picture of a sandhill crane nesting on top of a beaver pond, <laughs> which also is a pretty good place to nest. So in terms of, um, you know, Northwest Colorado, you know, areas like near Craig, Hayden, Steamboat, Walden, um, see sandhill cranes nesting, even down by uh, Crumling there, I have seen reports of sandhill cranes nesting and also out by Meeker as well. So in terms of Northwest Colorado, th there's a lot of, um, there is a lot of area that, that the cranes can nest in. And I just wanted to kind of show you what I mean by Northwest Colorado. So in terms of um, sandhill cranes, you know, I said that they nest in, in Northwest Colorado, um, but they also raise their chicks and colts here. And sandhill cranes have precocial chicks. They, uh, their chicks can see when they're born. They have down feathers to keep them warm and they can walk in about a day. Now, interestingly, sandhill cranes actually have asynchronous hatching, which means that one egg typically um, hatches before the other egg. So when they lay their eggs in the spring, so they'll lay their eggs about um, mid-May to, uh, or sorry, they'll lay their eggs about mid-April through maybe mid-May. And um, they lay the first egg and then they start incubating as soon as that egg is laid. And then a, a day or two later, they'll lay the second egg. So that means that when the eggs hatch, one egg actually hatches a day or two before the, uh, the other egg. Um, and um, typically only, you know, one, you know, they might be able to raise both chicks, but typically only one of the chicks survives. But, um, when they hatch, you know, they'll stay at the nest for maybe a day or two, and then they get up and leave. They leave that nest as soon as they are able to. Um, so they, um, will typically stay nearby the nest site. Um, in the same wetland or in nearby fields. When the chicks are young, they stay pretty close to the nest site. Um, they feed on, on a whole wide of range of things. And as the chicks get older, they might kind of expand their range, expand their territory um, and utilize a bigger area, but they stay in the same general area all summer long. And typically their nests hatch from starting about mid-May through uh, mid-June. Now, in terms of what cranes eat, um, they eat a wide variety of things. They are omnivores and they are very opportunistic. So they basically eat whatever they can find. Um, that includes tubers and roots, um, plants, worms, even rodents, amphibians like frogs, uh, reptiles, seeds um, like grain crops, insects, um, all sorts of different things that, that they will eat. And this really has allowed them to survive for so long. I mean, they are one of the oldest um, living bird species. And so having this, this variety of di diet has really allowed them to uh, survive for such a long time. So as their chicks continue to grow, um, you know, they still kind of stay nearby the nest area, but they will kind of expand the range. And you can notice the parent is feeding the chick right now. Uh, they, uh, the parents typically, uh, feed the chick, they'll present new materials, uh, new food to the chick. Um, and eventually after a couple of weeks, the chicks will start, uh, eating on their own, but the parents might still present, uh, food items to them. This is a, a colt that is, um, I believe this one's about two months old. And uh, one of their one of the ways that they can kind of hide from predators is to just hunker down in the grass <laughs> and um, hope that they're they are not seen. But you can see that their camouflage, their coloring helps them to kind of blend in with the grass. This is a um, a photo of um, a family with two adults and two colts. Um, the colts are probably two to three months old at this point. 
And this is just a, just to get you an idea of the kind of habitat that they're using. So uh, once the colts get older, they'll expand their territory and they'll start kind of getting out of the wetland. And also the wetlands are starting to dry up at this point as well, because this is probably sometime in July. And they start utilizing a bigger area so that they can forage. This is a, um, these are, are colts that are pretty old, um, just before fledging, and they fledge at about two and a half months. Uh, fledging meaning that they are able to fly. But you can kind of see their coloring is a little bit different than the adults. Uh, they don't have that red crown yet. They'll develop that in, you know, closer to almost a year old. Um, they have a pinkish bill. They have that kind of brown feathering on them. And um, this is how they, they look in midsummer. Now, when the chicks are, or the colts are old enough and they're able to start flying, um, you're get, kind of getting into August. So, uh, you know, they're, they start preparing for, for migration in, in late August and September. And so the cranes really have a short window where they, they can grow from, you know, the size of a chick all the way up to the size of an adult, which is about four or five feet tall. So they have a lot of growing to do all summer long. They grow three quarters of an inch to an inch per day. And uh, so they have a lot of growing to do and they need to be full size in order to fly, right? So um, this is a picture of two colts. You can see that they don't have the red on their heads. And um, uh, there's one of the colts and there's the other colt and then two adults there. And so in the fall, uh, really the late summer actually, um, in Northwest Colorado, um, the cranes start staging or gathering in large groups um, starting about late August. And they'll stay all the way up until, you know, mid-September or mid-October. Uh, but they gather up in these large groups in these staging areas and they really just bulk up for migration. So, Cranes that were not successful um, at nesting might arrive at the staging areas a little bit earlier. Um, cranes that um, that were successful in nesting um, and have colts, they might arrive at the staging areas a little bit later or not even go to a staging area. Uh, but basically the cranes use this time to bulk up for migration south. Um, this is just a picture of some of the areas that uh, cranes use in, in Northwest Colorado um, and, and other areas along their migration path as well, but they really uh, rely on agricultural fields. And um, here they're just eating the waste grain and other things that are in the field. So, um, you know, they might find rodents, they might find other bugs, um, really anything. And, and also that waste grain, they really rely on to um, get the nutrition that they need to migrate south. So this is a picture of the Yampa River in the background. And the Yampa River, if you don't know, flows from uh, the flat tops. Um, it actually flows north through Oak Creek and Steamboat and then heads west towards Hayden and Craig and then out towards Dinosaur National Monument. And um, the cranes really utilize the Yampa River for their staging. They roost in the Yampa River. Um, you can kind of see an area where they roost in the upper left. And they utilize the agricultural fields that are around there. And really they, they want this um, close proximity of, of available roosting sites in agricultural fields. So they don't have to travel too far to, um, to be able to feed and to be able to roost. Now, um, cranes roost in uh, shallow water, um, probably, you know, about uh, two, three, four inches of water, and um, often near gravel bars. So this is um, a picture of you know an area that they might might choose to roost in, and again, it's for this protection um, from predators. So you know they really rely on these water areas, you know wetlands for nesting, um, water, you know shallow water for roosting. It's really important for them. 
And as I mentioned during staging um, in, in the fall, cranes fi feed primarily in agricultural fields. And this is not just in Northwest Colorado, it's, it's um, in other areas along their migration path as well. Um, and they, they really love waste grain. <laughs> Uh, this is a picture. This is actually, um, you, if you notice, there's a colt in the middle, um, and a couple of adults in this picture. The um, this is actually a rye field that the cranes were feeding in one year. So, um, so I wanted to kind of give you that background of sandhill cranes and in Colorado, in Northwest Colorado, and what that really means. Um, and the areas that they use. So now I kind of want to jump into uh, Sandhill Crane Conservation because that's what our organization is all about. And there's a couple things that we do in terms of conservation. So one side of it is education and awareness. So we educate people about cranes, we educate people about their habitat, and we cre create awareness about Sandhill Cranes. And then the other side is the science part of it. And the science part of it is things like surveys, restoration, and habitat improvement programs. And so I'm going to kind of go through some of the things that we have been doing um, to help conserve sandhill cranes, um, at least, you know, Northwest Colorado, and, and hopefully, you know, uh, beyond that as well. And um, yeah, let's, let's go through that. So one thing that we do, um, so I'm going to start with, with education and awareness. One thing that we do is our uh, annual Yampa Valley Crane Festival. Um, hopefully you guys have heard of our crane festival. It occurs over Labor Day weekend. Um, this year it will be August 31st through September 3rd. And this is the 12th year that we have been doing the festival. Um, there are a, a lot of Sandhill Crane festivals throughout the United States. And for our festival, we have a couple of things that we do to help spread awareness and educate people about cranes. And one of them is speakers. So we have expert crane and bird speakers that come um, that give um, presentations on not just sandhill cranes, um, but different different species of cranes, um, very birdy you know, topics. And it's a really great way for people to get educated about sandhill cranes and other birds. And then the other thing that we do as part of our festival are our guided crane viewings. So we actually bring people out to the areas where they can see cranes out in the field. Uh, we bring them to an area where they can see the cranes fly out from their roost and then also um, feeding in the, in the agricultural fields. And we have um, expert crane um, guides that um, talk about different crane behaviors as people are viewing the cranes. So, you can really get a good uh, view of, of the different behaviors and things that cranes are doing um, by hearing and seeing it together. Um, and we always want to uh, work on uh, educating the next generation. So one thing we do are kids activities. You know, we try to engage kids in, um, it, you know, learning about sandhill cranes and, and starting to appreciate them and, and learn that they are in our backyards. So besides our festival, we do a number of other things to help create awareness. And um, one of these is our contests. We have, a, we have a number of contests actually that we help to create awareness and we try to target these for people of all ages. So our Crane Inspired uh, Creative Arts Scholarship Contest is for high school seniors and really high school seniors that are, are en route in Moffitt County but they actually have to create a visual or written um, piece um, inspired by Sandhill Cranes and present it to us and, and um, for the chance to earn scholarship money for continuing education. We have our photo contest, which anybody can enter. Uh, it's for amateur and uh, professional photographers. We have four different categories. So you can take pictures of cranes um, in the Yampa Valley, which is in Northwest Colorado, you can take pictures of cranes along their migration path. Um, so that's a really great way to just get people out and excited about sandhill cranes. Uh, last year, we actually started a contest for um, kind of more uh, middle school type students, so 10 to 15 year olds. 
and um, really to create a poster for our annual Yampa Valley Crane Festival. And so this is just a creative, fun contest to help uh, get awareness about um, awareness out about cranes and our festival. We also have our first crane sighting contest, which is actually going on right now. So when the cranes first arrive into the Yampa Valley um, in Northwest Colorado, you can document your sighting with a with a, a photo or a video and send it to us for the chance to win a small prize. And really, this is just to get people excited that the cranes are coming back and uh, create awareness that they're here. And then we also have our crane coloring contest, which is for kids ages three to 18. Um, they, they can uh, download it off of our website or pick up a, a copy um, at, at the libraries in Northwest Colorado and um, color it in for the chance to, to win a couple of prizes. Um, so these, you know, so doing these contests are just ways to create awareness. We also do a lot of other outreach events. Um, the upper left photo is a picture of some kids doing a migration game um, that is specific. We made it specific to the uh, Northwest Colorado. Uh, so the kids can actually follow along the migration path from Northwest Colorado all the way down to New Mexico, um, follow the migration path of sandhill cranes. We uh, attend the farmer's market in Steamboat Springs to help raise awareness and, and educate people. And then we also um, teach, teach uh, fifth graders about wetlands and how important wetlands are because cranes use wetlands uh, to nest. And so learning about wetlands and the interaction between cranes and wetlands is, is really important. So we do that as well. And then a big program that we do um, that we've been doing for probably 10 years now is our third grade interactive program. So we actually go into every um, third, grade, third grade classroom in Route and Moffat counties, and we educate the kids about cranes. Um, this is a really fun program and the kids absolutely love it. Uh, the, um, we, we talk about the life cycle of cranes. We um, have the kids come up and try to dance like cranes. And we do this with beautiful photographs and, um, it's really a fun program, and I it really just gets the kids so excited about sandhill cranes and their habitat. So that's another educational program that we do. And then we also do some interpreter programs. So uh, the other the other week I did a program at um, the Oak Creek Library uh, that um, talks about sandhill crane migration. Um, we, we do different programs for different community groups, uh, just to, you know, get the word out about Sandhill Cranes. And then I also, we also do a program with a local nonprofit in, in Steamboat Springs called Yampatika, um, where we kind of go birding and learn about Sandhill Cranes at the same time. So we get to bird, we get to learn about, um, the Yampa River and how important that is for Sandhill Cranes. And that's a really fun time as well. So we have all these different types of, you know, interpretive awareness, outreach programs to educate people about cranes, to, um, uh, you know, just create awareness around uh, sandhill cranes. And one thing that we have going on is our sandhill nest camera. So our, um, the, our, our crane nest camera, you have not heard of it before, it's this incredible tool that we have been doing. This is our third year doing it. And it, it's really, it's an educational and a scientific tool as well. So um, starting in 2021, we launched the, the Nest camera. And it is a live streaming camera on a local nest to the Yampa Valley um, near Hayden. And we, we showcase, we <laughs> live stream a Santel crane nest. We uh, record different moments on it and, and record highlight videos. So you can actually go to our website and our YouTube channel and watch all of the highlight videos from these um, sandhill crane nests. We actually had two different birds nesting. We had uh, one pair in 2021, and we actually had a second pair that we followed in 2022. And so it was a really cool way to see different types of um, cranes uh, nesting in Northwest Colorado. And we have learned so much from this nest camera. 
So not only is it a really great educational tool that people can get excited about, they can jump on the live stream during the nesting season, they can watch the highlight videos, um, but it's actually served as a really great um, scientific tool where and we've been learning a lot about sandhill crane nesting from this. And it's a really great way to, to learn about sandhill crane nesting and not interfere at all with, with the cranes nesting. So um, we're actually going to launch this camera um, April 12th. So, uh, <laughs> so tune in April 12th to our website, coloradocranes.org, and, and you can watch the, um, the Sandhill Crane Nest Camera. <clears throat> so I kind of talked about some of the educational stuff that we do because education is super important. Uh, we need to educate the next generation. We need to... Um, you know, create awareness about sandhill cranes and their habitat. You know, wetlands are incredibly important for not just sandhill cranes, but a whole slew of, of animals. So, um, so that's kind of one part of, of how we're conserving sandhill cranes is by education. And the other part is doing things through science. So one thing that we started working on last year and in cooperation with Colorado Parks and Wildlife is working on um, nesting surveys. So we're trying to just gather information about where sandhill cranes are nesting um, in, in Northwest Colorado, really all of Colorado, um, but typically they're, they're in Northwest Colorado. So we're trying to get a handle on where they are nesting, different habitats that they're using. Um, and this is, is really gonna give us a good idea of um, their, their range and if their range is expanding. Um, and how many, um, you know, pairs and how many cranes we actually have in Northwest Colorado. So this is one thing that we started. Uh, it's, it's still in the beginning phases, but we hope to kind of continue to, to work on um, uh, learning about where, where cranes are nesting. Another thing that we do is uh, fall staging surveys. So right around um, when we have the festival, that is the peak number of, of uh, peak number of cranes that are staging in Northwest Colorado. And last year we started a, um, a survey so that we can start quantifying how many cranes are using um, these staging areas, where the staging areas are. And sometimes the cranes kind of move around when they're staging. They might use one field one year and another field another year. So this is really gonna get a, give us an idea of the areas that cranes use, um, and how their numbers are. Uh, one thing that we have been doing as well is restoration projects. Um, this was uh, from last summer. We did a uh, wet meadow restoration project in cooperation with the U.S. Forest Service and the Yampa Valley Sustainability Council. And um, if anybody has um, heard of what meadow restoration, it was originally started for um, Gunnison sage grouse and greater sage grouse, but we partnered with them because this is also able to help sandhill cranes as well. So this will help um, sandhill crane uh, uh, chick rearing habitat. Uh, we started this project in areas that um, there, are, there are previous sandhill crane nests, so hopefully they're being used. Um, but we just we did, just did this restoration project, this specific restoration project last summer. So, but basically, what it, what this is, uh, wet meadow restoration, um, takes these areas that are kind of uh, where the water would run down and kind of gut out um, on the hillsides, and become become these you know, the water would kind of gut out and and. Uh, it, the water would <laughs> struggling here to to describe this. Basically, what we what we do is we take rocks and try to slow down the water, so that the water spreads out and it doesn't create a you know cut in the landscape. And by doing that, you can actually create these wet meadows in a very dry landscape. And so we did this up in California Park, um, where which is a really great sandhill crane nesting area. And um, it helps to get these areas and have them stay wetter further into the summer and helps to provide a lot of food. And not just food for sandhill cranes, but food for a lot of other wildlife as well. I mentioned grouse, um, elk, 
all sorts of different wildlife. So it's a benefit to um, sandhill cranes and numerous other um, species in these areas. And then a, a longstanding program that we have is called Crops for Cranes. So I mentioned that during fall staging, sandhill cranes um, really rely on these um, agricultural fields. And they, it's not just during fall staging, it's during migration as well. So if you went down to like the San Luis Valley and Monta Vista area, um, they, they rely on, an, on agricultural fields and also during their winter areas in places like Bosque del Apache. Now, the issue with, with um, areas like Hayden, uh, where the where the cranes really um, there's a big staging area in the Yampa Valley in Northwest Colorado. Um, the problem is that the grain production has actually decreased in the last 50 years, mostly due to economic reasons. But um, that means that there's not as much waste grain for sandhill cranes, and there's not as much habitat for them. Now sandhill cranes, like I said, they rely on these waste grains to gain enough energy for migration. So what are we doing about that? So we started this Crops for Cranes program back, I think it was 2016. Um, and this is to really to ensure an adequate food supply for the cranes during their critical fall staging. Um, it's also a good way to provide safe areas for the cranes and safe areas for people to be able to view the cranes, either through our festival or you know, the public can also view the cranes as well. And I just kind of want to talk a little bit more about this program. So we work with ranchers and farmers um, throughout this program, uh, mostly in the Yampa Valley near Hayden and Craig area. And we, we work with them to either buy seed or to um, help them, you know, plant uh, grain crops that cranes like. So things like oats, barley, wheat, and we really want them to, um, you know, they can plant the, the crop, they can harvest the crop, but we want them to harvest it kind of closer to when uh, sandhill cranes stage so that it's, you know, a nice waste grain field right when the cranes need it the most, which is when they start staging. Um, and this is really a good way to ensure that the cranes have adequate nutrition for their migration. So um, this is a really great program that we keep building every year and um, we, we hope that it's really benefit, benefiting the cranes. So I talked about different education programs that we do, different science programs that we do. You know, we're always trying to um, uh, do more, um, you know, think of more and more ways that we can um, get the word out about sandhill cranes and also to conserve their habitat. So this, this is just a little bit of the, the things that we do in order to try to conserve cranes. And, um, you know, if you have any other ideas for us, you know, we'd love to hear them. And um, yeah. And with that, um, I want to thank everybody for um, listening in today. Um, you can um, email me if you have questions. Um, our, our website is up here. You can follow us on social media. And um, thank you guys so much. And hopefully you learned a little bit about sandhill cranes and um, especially sandhill cranes in Northwest Colorado. No, well, that was great, Erin. Thank you very much. I, I certainly learned, I didn't know cranes painted themselves. That's so fascinating. <laughs> so I had to do a little Google and figure out if any other birds painted themselves as well. So that's super interesting. Um, well, thank you so much. So one question came up was that are, are there human supported habitats like, like the national wildlife refuges um, up uh, in Northwest Colorado for the cranes, or, or is it all kind of the Colorado Crane um, Conservation Coalition that is trying to set up those areas currently for cranes in Colorado? Yeah, for so for Northwest Colorado, it's um, I feel like it, it's a little bit trickier for us because we do not have a national wildlife refuge. Oh, okay. Um, in areas like um, uh, Monta Vista in, in the San Luis Valley where they stage and in their wintering area like Bosque del Apache, there are wildlife refuges. And so they can really, um, you know, grow crops for the cranes and really manage the landscape for cranes. Um, 
we I, I think it's a little bit trickier out by us because we a lot of the area around here is actually private land. Yeah. So that's where we have, you know, we have our crops for cranes program where we are working with ranchers and farmers. Um, but it it's it's definitely I, I think a little bit trickier out, out by us. We do not have national wildlife refuges. Gotcha. Interesting. Interesting. What is the what's the conservation status of the the greater Sand Hill Crane? Um, you know, it, nationally, I guess would be the if they if they're primarily like trying staying within the U, the U.S. borders, more or less. What uh, what do they have an ICUN rating or anything like that? Federal rating? Um, I don't believe so. So okay. you know, sandhill cranes. Um, so there's 15 species of cranes in the world. Um, sandhill cranes um, are are of least concern. Okay. Um, they, but you know, they were, you know, back in the seventies, they were endangered. Oh um, yeah. And then there were a lot of re, um, uh, reintroduction, not reintroduction, um, uh, programs to help, uh, um, increase their populations, especially in the 1990s and, um, their population has come back. Um, so they're not endangered like the whooping cranes are. But they are, it's still critical to conserve them because their habitat is so important and the cranes are so important. And, you know, we can easily go back to a time when they, you know, when, when they um, were endangered and, and there were not very many of them, if we're not oh. careful in making sure that they have the habitat necessary for them to survive. Oh, yeah. I think it's very easy to, to assume just because something is like rated least concern and things like that. I mean, uh, the, they're an important part of the Colorado landscape, uh, the the biome in Colorado. And like you mentioned, the wetlands are so important for so many different species that anything we can do to support their conservation, preservation, and and uh, you know uh, expansion back into areas where they were before. Um, what it, regardless of whatever species is leading that charge is so very important for the the just the ecosystem in general. So that's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. yeah, and a lot, of, a lot of people consider sandhill cranes a ambassador species. So you know, you, you think about conserving cranes. You know, they're big, they're loud, they're easy to notice. They, you know, it's easy to um, get excited by them. Um, but they do help conserve habitat for amphibians, which are on the decline yeah. and are very important. So, um, so yeah, sandhill cranes are con are considered a ambassador species. Very cool. Yeah. So we had another question came up, and I think you perhaps touched on this. But do cranes paint themselves only when they arrive on the breeding grounds, or do they do it at other times uh, during migration and their general? you know, day-to-day -day life? Yeah, so um, typically it's when they arrive on their breeding grounds. Um, some okay. cranes might um, paint themselves during their during their migration, but they do it in preparation for nesting. So they paint their feathers in, in the springtime. Um, they nest and that paint actually stays on their feathers the entire life of the feather. So oh, okay. they are still painted in late summer, um, and late summer is when they start molting and you'll kind of see speckled cranes where, you know, the gray feathers are coming in, but they still have some painted feathers. Um, and then once they grow new feathers, they're all gray and they'll wait until the springtime to paint them again. Okay. So we had, we have a easier question that I'm going to give you probably first. And then we have a, another question, uh, talking about whooping cranes and sandhill cranes. But how how long do the the sandhill cranes uh, stay in northwest Colorado? Yeah, so they arrive in the spring, typically you know about March. Um, they nest in April and May, and a little bit into June. They raise their their colts all summer long, and then they stage in the fall, um, and then they leave sometime in September or early October. Okay. So. so Okay, so Andrea asked a question. Um, back in the early 90s, whooping cranes were fostered within the Western Sandhill population mm -hmm. that uses Basque as of their wintering grounds. And, and the question is, did those fostered whooping cranes naturally disappear from the Western Sandhill 
populations. I mean, do you have any familiarity with that fostering program? You know, the, the layperson might assume that those fostered whooping cranes would then adopt a sandhill crane migrational route because that's what they've grown up with, they've imprinted. Um, did we see hybrids with the sandhills? Do you have do you have any insight on on the that whooping crane um, situation? Yeah, yeah. So I would not I would not say I'm an expert on that at all, but I know a little bit about it. Um, so yeah, they basically um, put a uh, whooping crane, um, eggs into sandhill crane nests and had the sandhill cranes raise the whooping cranes. And they thought that was all great and everything seemed like it was working out really well until it was time to mate. And that was the issue. Yeah. So the whooping cranes did not understand that they were whooping cranes. They wanted to mate with sandhill cranes. Ah. And so, um, as far as I am aware, the um, the popu the whooping crane population just kind of died out because they weren't they weren't mating with each other. They they were trying to mate with the sandhills. Yeah, that's about yeah, all. That, that. Unfortunately, that makes sense. <laughs> but uh, that's too bad. You know, you never, it was a good experiment. It was a good experiment. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Oh, and I had a question and it just flew out of my mind. Um, yeah, I can't remember it now. Do you have anything, Linda? No, I, I don't. This has been really informative. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not seeing any more questions come in, Aaron. So I'm gonna thank you very much for tonight. It was really informative. I'm checking out your website right now, trying to make plans maybe for the migration celebration and all that good stuff. Uh, and so maybe. Uh, oh, one more question popped in. Um, how are these cranes related to the cranes that we hear so much about um, migrating to Nebraska? Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a good question. So, um, it, so the cranes that migrate through Nebraska are mainly lesser sandhill cranes. So they're a okay. little bit smaller. It's a different subspecies of of sandhill crane. Um, they do have a few greater sandhill cranes that migrate through Nebraska. Um, and then they also have the whooping cranes that migrate through Nebraska. Um, but what we have here in Northwest Colorado is the greater sandhill crane. So they're a little bit taller. Um, and we have the Rocky Mountain uh, population of greater okay. sandhill cranes. So um, it, it's it's kind of like a specific, you know, flock of, of sandhill cranes. So the ones sure. that go through, that go through um, Nebraska, the lessers will go all the way up into northern um or nor the northern U.S., um, Canada, and even Alaska to breed, and the greater sandhill cranes. It's a different population that migrates through Nebraska. Will go up to northern, um, uh, northern U.S. to breed. Okay, excellent. And we do get, you know, in terms of Colorado, um, we do get lesser sandhill cranes on the Front Range that that migrate through the area, um, okay. and then they also might uh, use the the Monta Vista. Um, San Luis Valley to stage in and also go down to New Mexico. Um, but they they kind of stay on the eastern side of Colorado and the graders stay on the western side of Colorado. Excellent. So we've got a we've got another question um, from Paula coming in. Um, ha have you guys been affected by the drought in northwest Colorado like we've seen, you know, down in the southeast or in various other parts of Colorado? And the U.S. in general is dealing with, with drought conditions across many parts of its range. Um, how is that affecting the cranes in northwest Colorado? Yeah, so, um, you know, it just, it, it, it it makes their habitat, their nesting habitat, you know, they nest in wetlands. It's, it, it's harder for them to find different areas to nest. Um, you know, in, in certain areas, in certain years, if the drought is really bad, um, you know, the wetlands might not be suitable for nesting. So it definitely affects them there. It can affect food, uh, their food. Um, and, uh, you know, an area, in, in years where we don't have as much rain there's definitely a decrease in their food and we definitely see that they can't raise as many colts 
um, in, in really good years when they can find a lot of food, they can raise two colts, which is not typical for them. Oh, okay. So, I mean, they're only raising about one young every three years. So they actually have really- Oh, wow. Food. Um, I would say, you know, last year we actually had a uh, good rainfall all summer long. So, um, we, uh, you know, I, I think the, the cranes did really well. Um, and this year we have a really big snowpack in Northwest Colorado. So <laughs> hopefully that will, um, that hopefully that will be good for them over the summer when they're, when they're nesting, um, and raising their, raising their young. Sure. If you if you see a decrease in the amount of wetlands, do you see cranes? I mean, is it is the typical result that cranes don't nest at all, or do they just have failed nests that are more likely to be predated on because they're not protected by the environment or the this habitat? Uh, regardless of the food reserves, do they even attempt to nest if the habitat's not suitable? That's a great question. Um, I, I I don't I don't know the answer to that one. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, it, it, cranes are very. Um, it, they like to go back to the same nesting area. They don't typically put their nests in the same exact spot, but they'll go back to the same wetlands. They have a high oh, nest, okay. nest site fidelity. So. Yeah. Um, so I think they'll still go back. They'll probably still attempt to nest. Is my guess. Um, and they just may or may not succeed. Sure, sure. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Erin. Once again, a wonderful presentation. Really enjoyed it. Learned a lot. Uh, and thanks for all the work you do. We really appreciate it. You know, you're making Colorado more beautiful and more full for the rest of us. So we really appreciate that. So. Well, great. Well, thank you all for listening. And um, yeah, if you have any uh, any other questions, you know, you can always email me, um, visit our website. Uh, we're also always looking for volunteers. If you live in Northwest Colorado and want to volunteer with us, um, that would be great as well. Excellent. Well, all right, everybody, you have a good night, have a good week, uh, and take care. Thank good you, night, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>